Hello, everyone. My name is Monica Lewis. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the engagement manager at SMU Data Arts. I'm going to pause and provide my physical description. I'm an African-American woman in my mid-30s wearing a blue blouse, and my hair is twisted. I have a white background behind me. On behalf of our team at SMU Data Arts, we want to extend our sincere thanks and appreciation for joining us for today's session as we unlock insights. It's an exploration on national trends facing art and cultural organizations. Before I introduce our amazing um, presenter, Dr. Zani Boss, I wanna take a quick moment to pause to reflect and acknowledge the land. While we come today on a virtual platform, we take this moment to acknowledge the significance of the lands to which we all call home. From coast to coast, we take this moment to acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all First Nations people. At SMU Data Arts, we acknowledge the Apache, Caddo, Comanche, Kushata, Tonkawa, the Wichita and affiliated Kichi, Waco, Taiwakoni and Lene Lenape peoples upon whose traditional territories SMU Data Arts now exist. We'll share a link to a map of indigenous communities past and present, and we invite you in the chat to share your own personal land acknowledgement if you would like to. Now quickly for a bit of housekeeping, Today's session is designed to be highly engaging. So there will be moments where we will ask you to reflect and share, and you may even be invited to come off of mute and talk with us. With that, I do wanna preface that we are recording today's session. So we do hope that you keep that in mind. I wanna quickly just share some quick ways to engage with us during our time together. Um, and Zani, if you could go to that second slide, there we go. We have a, a Zoom dashboard in front of you and you are able to engage with us through a couple of methods. We have the Q&A feature where you're welcome to share any questions that you have with us during any point of the process. Um, we are, have a team behind the scenes, uh, Rochelle Brisson and Ben Eisenhower who are ready to assist you with any questions that you have. We also have a chat feature that's available to you. You're able to respond to prompts, share your questions, or any kind of thoughts that you have. Um, and I encourage you to double check that you're using the everyone uh, on the drop down menu and not just the panelists so that you can share your comments with everyone who's joined us today. And lastly, um, we are we do have microphones available. So if you would like to engage with us by verbally speaking, you can raise your virtual hand and the team behind the scenes, if you're selected, will give you permissions. Once that permission opens, you'll have a timer that's gonna let you know how quickly you need to ask that question. We're using that timer just to keep us um, in uh, eye on time because we only have a few minutes with you. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna remind us all again that we are recording today. And so keeping those ways to engage is some ways that you can talk with us during today's presentation. Finally, we do have closed captioning available. Um, you can use your CC. You'll find the CC icon on your uh, dashboard, and that will allow you to view closed captioning. You're able to adjust the settings if you would need to. Um, if you need any assistance with any of the features, feel free to send us a chat, and our team behind the scenes will be able to support you. With that, I want to go ahead and welcome uh, our amazing speaker, speaker, Dr. Zani Voss. Dr. Voss is the director of SMU Data Arts, the National Center for Arts Research. Zani has published an array of articles examining strategic factors that influence organizational performance in leading academic journals and marketing and management. Zani, we're so excited to learn from you. Thank you, Monica. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking time out to join us. Um, I'll provide my own physical description, visual description. I'm a mixed race woman in my very late 50s who uses she, her pronouns. I have uh, black shoulder length curly hair. I'm wearing a turquoise sleeveless top today. So today we're here to talk about trends. Spoiler alert, uh, you know, overall there was an uptick in many financial and operating trends in 2023. Nevertheless, full recovery is still in process. So this look into the rearview mirror, you know, provides context for the underlying challenges that a lot of organizations are still facing today. Before we dive in, though, um, first we want to hear your story, Monica. 
Absolutely. We told you this is high engaging. So let's chat a bit. If you could uh, pull out that chat feature that we just shared with you and tell us a little bit about who's in the room. If you could introduce yourself, your work and your role there, um, and a little bit about your organization, just your name, and one example of recent success that you've had within your organization. It could be from a revenue perspective, staffing perspective, or maybe even a bottom line perspective. Um, we just want to hear from you. So I'll give it a few seconds to give folks a minute to adjust to this request, and I'll shift it back to you, Zani. Well, if you would, we're really interested in hearing, you know, this isn't just about challenges, it's also about what go, what's going well, and we'd love to hear from you about, you know, a small success, large success, um, just to hear what is going well. While you're thinking about that, um, I'll share the agenda. So today, I'm going to walk through national trends and overall revenue mix and then break it down on emerging trends in earned and contributed funding by sources for arts and cultural organizations. And then we're gonna discuss the evolving landscape for staff and for arts workers. Um, we're gonna tie these first two areas together with an analysis of changes in expenses, bottom line, working capital. Uh, and then I'm gonna share some insights into how organizations and the funders that support them can plan for their financial health in this very dynamic economy. And we're gonna wrap up with some time for questions and discussion. So Monica, were there some successes, uh, some chat comments related to, to successes that folks uh, articulated? Zani, they're coming in hot and heavy, and I have a few. Um, I have someone from New York who's excited to see audiences back in their theaters and what has been a pretty strong season ticket sales win. So that's really exciting to hear. And I'll share another one. We're getting a lot of folks sharing some really good stories. Um, someone from the True Colors Theater Company shared a recent success was being awarded a very large grant to build our staff and to help advance their strategic plan. So some great work and more stories are coming in by the second. Congratulations to True Colors. Uh, and it's really great to hear audiences coming back. Uh, you know, I wanted to share this quote, which was how someone was doing. This was uh, a theater leader in 2023, the uh, first quarter of 2023, because we were planning a return during COVID and we thought it would come back to what it was. It'll never be back to what it was. If we knew folks weren't gonna come back right away, especially for new works, how can we properly scale the operations and the execution of them? Uh, you know, This was a, a, a quote from an interview that I conducted as part of a project with the Ford Foundation. You know, Even though it was from about a year ago, the numbers tell us that the issue that it raises, uh, dwindling ticket purchases and by extension related uh, private donations that failed to keep pace with inflation, earn revenue challenges. It actually persisted well into the remaining quarters of 2023. And clearly not all, but many organizations are still experiencing challenges now. So let me just tell you a, a little bit about the organizations that we're examining through, through this data. Uh, we analyzed mean and median trends from 2019 to 2023 for 233 arts organizations. Uh, the budgets ranged from $11,000 up to $15.8 million uh, in 2023, with an average budget of $780,000. All are organizations who have provided data either to a funder through the cultural data profile or through a TCG's fiscal survey in each of the past five years. And I just want to say a huge public thank you to all organizations whose time and effort invested in the CDP allows us to share these findings. This is your story. Uh, so you'll see here also the breakdown of budget size, you know, similar to the budget size distribution in the universe of all arts nonprofits in the US is kind of the, the rationale for why we did the break uh, points where they are. Small organizations budget under half million dollars, 70% of these organizations, 77% in the universe of all arts nonprofits. The medium budgets between half million and just under a million dollars, 8% um, in the universe, 15% for us, and then large organizations budget above a million, and you can see kind of different budget categories there. 15% uh, of the universe, 15% of the organizations studied here. These organizations are located in 14 states. 12% self-identify as being of, by, or for a Black, Indigenous, or people of color community or tradition, 88% do not. The average non-BIPOCs organization budget 
back in 2019 was about 2.5 times the size of the average BIPOC organization's budget. So 2.5, that narrowed to roughly 1.7 times uh, by 2013. So 819,000 relative to 490,000. This tells us two things. So on average, they had neither the same starting place nor the same ending place. So any notion of increased revenue for the BIPOC organizations leveling the playing field, you can see it's still not a reality. And so consider that equity in percentage changes um, sometimes it has a weird effect when you look at magnitude of the values that are changing, right? So when the, the numerator or the denominator shifts with small figures, it sounds like it's gonna be a lot, like going from $100 to $200, it's a doubling of value, but it's still only a hundred bucks. So thinking about that into context also. Uh, we take inflation to account since what cost a dollar back in 2019 cost a dollar 19 in 2023. And many of you probably are feeling the real effects of buying power reduced over time. And you can assume that findings apply to organizations of all sizes and uh, regardless of whether or not they are of by for a community of color, unless I note otherwise. So let's dive into looking at some overall uh, revenue trends and then we're gonna break it down by source. So here you're, we're looking at total operating revenue. It neared its return to pre-pandemic levels, although its composition shifted. So we're looking at changes in the magnitude and the composition of earned contributed and investment revenue here. Keep in mind that these percentages are relative to considerable variation in total operating revenue. So, you know, earned revenue in 2019 was 42% of 637,000 and only 21% of 537,000 in 2021. You know, we see looking from 2021 through the last two years, that recovery is well underway. Since that low in 2021, overall operating revenue was 14% higher in 2023 than in 2019 in nominal terms, just meaning in absolute dollars. But when you take into account inflation, it was 4% lower in terms of its buying power. Uh, organizations became and remain more dependent on contributed revenue for their survival. It has been their revenue engine. The majority of medium and large organizations in the study reported some level of investment instrument income annually, as did 40% of small organizations. Viewed though through the lens of cultural mission-centered uh, organizations, only one in four BIPOC organizations reported investment income in at least one of the last five years, so to a far lesser extent. Your attention may have been drawn to this 13% of investment revenue in 2021. Maybe this is true with your organization. With doors closed and earned revenue slowed down to a trickle, a lot of organizations made the decision to increase the endowment draw at a time when the S&P 500 was actually generating some pretty impressive returns. So that's the anomaly year right there. These trends are similar, but of different magnitude regardless of organization size. Uh, let's take a moment and just dive into earned revenue. You know, here we're looking overall. So earned revenues recovered, but not fully. And it wasn't just lower as a proportion of total revenue, as we saw in the last slide, it was lower in absolute terms. You know, there's good news that it doubled from 2021 to 2023, but growth still fell short of inflation by 19% for the average organization in this study. Uh, I wanna note that real earned revenue growth was the case for 44% of the BIPOC organization studied. So not the majority, but still proportionally more than the 22% of non-BIPOC organizations for whom this was the case. There's been considerable recovery um, and I don't wanna rain on that parade, but this is a huge hole to fill as you well know, considering that it was 42% of total operating revenue back in 2019. Let's break this down a little bit further. Um, let's look at admissions related revenue, since that is an important share of total rev earned revenue for the average organization in, in normal times. You know, here we're saying that in-person admissions generated, generated revenue overall, it naturally slowed to a trickle during the pandemic and has been growing and bouncing back ever since then. Uh, it was 35% lower still though in inflation adjusted figures over time. 
um, this trend is pretty stable for organizations of every ilk with only really minor variation in magnitude. So this is just through December this past year. These early signs uh, are that subscription and membership revenue down 68% for inflation. Uh, it may be an area that's permanently scarred. Uh, this was upwards north of 65% for organizations of, of every ilk and every mission center. Now we know that COVID was a major factor in this drop off, but in many ways, this is really just intensifying a declining trend that existed way before pre-pandemic. Uh, you know, for example, in some research that we had done with uh, Teresa Iring of PCG and a, an economist, Memo Lasaga, we, we learned kind of a long arc of history that the highest level in the past 20 years for subscription revenue for theaters was back in 2005. Uh, you know, the pandemic exacerbated the ongoing trend of declines. Uh, they had dropped precipitously during the Great Recession. Again, after COVID, we're not sure this is an area that will come back to one of it, its once robust level. Let's look at coupling this admission related revenue with the attendance trends and pricing trends. Um, so these two factors combined to form both the, the pricing and the attendance, of course, combined to form the, the revenue. Uh, when we combine them, we see that attendance, admissions related revenue, and low ticket prices were all lower by double digits. And the drop in the number of subscribers was a precipitous 43%. Uh, a number of different studies confirm that the earlier organizations could resume in person activity, the sooner their attendees and the associated revenue returned. And our partner at PRG Arts, a prominent arts consulting firm with a large set of data on the US and the UK. Um, household performing arts purchases, they reported that theater was the hardest hit and the slowest to recover among the different performing arts sectors that it studied in terms of tickets, ticket revenue, and number of gifts. Now, in-person attendance has been coming back since about May of 2021 of the present, but slowly. The question mark now is how long will the data show that on average it plateaued? Um, you know, no doubt those of you here are contemplating different packaging, programmatic offerings, location of programming and pricing. Uh, so I want to spend a moment just kind of on this topic of pricing. I want you to think about the stories that you see when you look at combining the percentage of changes in attendance and revenue. So one of the stories that jumps out to me is in looking at it, the drop in the number of subscribers is less than the corresponding drop in subscription revenue. It's likely it's the case that subscribers are paying much less in total over time with lower prices or they're opting for fewer productions per subscription. Similarly, uh, given that attendance is down, in-person attendance less than single ticket revenue, we can infer that there's probably more volume being sold at the lower end of single ticket, uh, ticket prices than at the high end. So thinking about kind of knitting together these different uh, threads of information into what's the overall story. Now, this looking at probably selling more volume at the lower end of prices, that was the case for small and for medium organizations, but the reverse was true for the large organizations. Their drop in attendance was 43% of the five-year period, double rate, the rate of the, their smaller peers, and they raised their ticket prices by 50% more than inflation on average. So. And when I look at this, you know, we the story is there's fewer people paying higher ticket prices for the larger organizations. It kind of begs the questions of who are they attracting, whose needs are being met in a community. The medium organizations actually decreased both their low and their high ticket prices. They saw a 56% drop in ticket revenue, but only a 17% drop in attendance. So thinking about you know, their perspective on inflation, not only affecting the spending power of the organizations, but also having a very real and perceived impact on ticket buyers and their price sensitivity. So looking across different size organizations, what kinds of strategies do they employ? Here we're looking at attendance at these BIPOC organizations, which was actually more stable than it was for their non-BIPOC peers. On average, the BIPOC organizations here experienced a much greater rebound in in-person attendance. Their 2023 attendance was only 4% below that of 2019 compared to 22% for the non-BIPOC peers. 
when more data comes in, we're going to tell whether the experience of this smaller sample of 20 non-BIPOC organizations was actually indicative of trends for their peers more broadly. Among them, we saw that 37% of the BIPOC organizations had higher in-person attendance in 2023 than in 2019, yet 52% had attendance that dropped by double-digit percentages over time, so a bit of variation. This is admissions-related revenue, so let's look at how well do organizations earn revenue. You can see here in these pie charts, small, medium, and large organizations earn revenue from diverse activities. And one thing we know, you know, when you think about um, best approach to reducing risk in a stock portfolio, diversification can be a good thing. What we see is that earned revenue from education programs, this is 2023, was a, as big of a slice of the earned revenue pie as was ticket sales. So the red slice of the pie compared to the combination of the navy blue and the turquoise slices of the pie. And we also see that revenue from contracts and tours, kind of the medium blue slice at the top of the pies, plays an increasingly important role as budget size gets smaller. Let's take a look at uh, contributed revenue. Let's move on to contributed. We see that contributed revenue actually saved organizations. Uh, its growth exceeded inflation by 16%, which means that in absolute dollar terms, that was 38% growth. On average, BIPOC organizations we studied more than doubled their contributed revenue, 113% growth, even after accounting for inflation, whereas growth was 11% for non-BIPOC organizations. Question is, is that level of growth realistically sustainable? Well, let's, let's take a look at where did it come from? We're going to look at trends in funding sources to see uh, if there is some consistent growth in some revenue engine that can be expected to continue into the future. Let, let's start with private philanthropy, private giving by source. Here we see that among private support stakeholder groups, only foundations increase their support in the absolute terms. This chart is showing dollars before inflation. If we ignore inflation, the story for private philanthropy would be that giving basically maintained a steady state and that foundation support showed pretty substantial growth uh, with 11% higher in total if you combine all private sources driven by foundation funding in 2023 than 2019. But here, when we add in the adjustment for inflation, and unfortunately, inflation is real. So if a donor simply renews at the same dollar amount, year after year, I gave you $500 last year, I'm gonna give you $500 this year, and that feels good but it's not gonna help the organization to have the same buying power over time. It just, same dollars do not go uh, as far as they once did. When we adjust for inflation and combine all private sources, they were actually 7% lower over time. So these inflation adjusted percentages show 15% decline from other individuals, 21% for trustees, 15% decline for corporations. And the average small, medium, and large budget organization, they all experienced double digit decreases in giving from trustees, other individuals and corporations with the biggest reductions experienced by the medium budget organizations. For BIPOC organizations, so looking, slicing the data through a different lens, giving from trustees and other individuals rose during the pandemic and then nosedived in 2023 with levels 50% and 56% below 2019 levels respectively. So a lot of support for a while and then kind of donor exhaustion. It's important to point out that growth in foundation giving was not the experience for organizations of every size. That foundation giving was really the domain of medium-sized organizations uh, so, whose support from foundations actually surpassed inflation by 18%. Small and large organizations foundation support was higher in absolute dollars, but those amounts fell short of what was needed to account for inflation in both cases. For non-BIPOC organizations, foundation giving was 15% lower in real dollars. For BIPOC organizations in this study, it more than quadrupled over time, rising annually. Again, though, keep in mind that what I said before about changes when we're talking about smaller dollar figures, and sometimes that magnitude um, 
makes it feel like it's a bigger change than what the dollars in your pocket would actually tell you. So let's say in, in government funding. When we do, we see that exceptional federal government support drove the rise in contributed revenue. Total government funding supported an increasing level of the average organization's expenses over the past four years, uh, rising up from 4% up to 21% of expense support in 2022, and then down to 9% in 2023. This varies considerably with organization size, Government funding tended to support about a quarter of a small organization's budget annually. These organizations, the small ones, saw only a minor boost directly from the federal relief funds, but they began seeing the inflow of federal funds through their local and state agencies who were into redistribution or regranting of federal funds in 2023. Uh, so a lot of federal relief block grants benefited the small organizations. Similar story for medium budget organizations, although their boost in the direct federal relief was a bit stronger during the pandemic. Large organizations, and especially the uh, performing arts organizations, were the biggest beneficiaries of exceptional federal government support programs like the Small Business Administration's Payroll Protection Program and the SVOG grants. Specifically, government funding supported 2% of large organizations' expenses back in 2019, up to 21% in 2022, down to 8% in 2023. They actually saw uh, triple digit increases also in state and federal support uh, over 2019. And their local growth, uh, their local support grew by 20, uh, by 61% above inflation, which I just found pretty remarkable that every layer of government was supporting the larger organizations. You know, you think about the direct and indirect federal relief programs intended uh, to support to save jobs in the arts actually fulfill their mission to a large extent. But once this trickle down of federal funding kind of makes its way through the local and state regranting programs, what will be the future re revenue engine to sustain recovery and growth? And I, I wanna stop and consider again, this revenue mix back from 2023. Is there a contributed revenue source poised to grow support at a pace that keeps up with rising costs? which are still rising, but at a much lower rate now. Large organizations in particular are vulnerable since their biggest and their only contributed revenue growth came from government funding. It was exceptional and unlikely to continue. Before we move to talking about staffing and personnel though, Monica, let's stop for a chat. Oh yes, let's chat about it. Zani, we do have a question that came in as you were presenting uh, mm -hmm. about the revenue mix. Will there be a, uh, a view to look at earned income by source by organizational type? So there's someone from the theater space that wants to know a little bit more about theaters. In the presentation, we don't have it broken out by arts and cultural discipline with only 233 organizations. Uh, we very quickly get into sample sizes within categories that are too small to be able to draw any inferences from. But if you wait until uh, July, we'll have a much bigger view to present to you because we are now getting in a pretty high influx of data on 2023. Uh, so I wish I had something more stable and robust about theaters in particular to share right at this moment, but uh, we will very soon. Awesome. And I just want to invite folks to share in the chat or raise your virtual hand and let us know if the findings are connected to how you see things happening within your space in the world. Um, when you were talking about uh, audiences coming back, I saw one of our comments share that they're still working to bring back their audiences. So if you could, if you would like to raise your hand and share maybe a first response or how this is working or you see the data re responding in your organization, we'd love to hear from you. So let's chat about it. And I think we have one person raising their hand and we're gonna go ahead and give you permissions to share your response. Uh, Joseph, let's hear from you. Hi, um, thank you. Um, I just had a question on the, um, the um uh, giving by individuals um is it do you have enough um breakout to um kind of generational giving you know because so many people gen z's millennials boomers i always find that interesting how 
the different mentality they have and the different messaging that they have to get them to contribute. And it is it the same way on the revenue side um, on those different um, age groups? Do you have experience who's coming back faster to theaters live? Because they think so differently. Um, just an insight, maybe, if you can expand on that, on the different mm -hmm. categories. Thank sure. you. Thank, thanks for the uh, for the comment. Is that within the CDP we don't collect revenue by demographics of who gave. On the other hand, though, our partners at TRG Arts, or if you just go to trgarts.com, they have they've been doing an incredible job throughout the pandemic and post pandemic of providing analyses. Um, that do talk about generational giving uh, as well as generational attendance. So I would strongly encourage you to, to visit their site and see what they're reporting on. They, they have predominantly data on performing arts organizations rather than visual arts, but there's some visual arts that are, that are in there too. Thank you very much. Sure. Awesome. Zani, I think we'll just allow folks to share in the chat and keep mm -hmm. us going forward with the data. I'm going to move on now to talk about staffing, staffing and personnel expense trends. Uh, on average, staffs became larger through the addition of permanent part-time positions. Uh, they reinvested in people. So organizations tended to retain permanent full-time staffing levels while slowly adding part-time permanent staff over the past couple of years. This trend was really stable regardless of organization budget size, whether or not the org's mission is rooted in a community of color, but to varying degrees. Corresponding to the 20% rise in staff levels, total payroll was 32% higher in absolute nominal terms and 11% higher when we take inflation into account. So in each of the last two years, growth in compensation has exceeded growth in uh, inflation for organizations of every ilk, which is really exciting. This was especially true for BIPOC organizations whose investments in personnel rose 49% above inflation while their permanent part-time staff more than doubled from three to seven people. So doubling total permanent staff for BIPOC organizations on average from five to 10. And we know what a big subject this is. Um, you know, the ability to attract and retain employees has become a big flashpoint for the arts, putting added strain on the often overburdened employees who were there, who were likely burned out from having weathered the stress of managing through the recent crisis. In 2022, uh, you know, just as a point of reference, if you looked across all nonprofit arts and cultural disciplines, so not just this data, but uh, publicly available data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, it looks at employees and freelance artists, the average annual salary in the United States for arts workers was $33,000, $33,024. A bit above the poverty level for a family of four, but not by much. So seeing increases in payment to personnel is, in, in my mind, a huge investment in organizational capacity and the people who make the work. Organizations remain committed to artists. Uh, in total, they hired 19% more artists in 2023 than in 2019, and growth in compensation paid to artists outpaced inflation for these organizations by 31%. So now kind of we're, we're gonna knit together with the revenue and expenses and look at bottom line and, and working capital. So here's the same unrestricted operating revenue chart that I've been showing, but framed alongside of expenses. Um, you see here that the dollars spent reported by organizations each year before inflation in this chart. And I wanted to show the two of those two things together because it drives home the fact that even with big fluctuations in activity, organizations did a remarkable job of living within their means during the crisis, the, the level of flexibility and nimbleness the average organization cut total expenses during the pandemic then added them back when stores reopened. Revenue was 14% and expenses 18% higher in 2023 than 2019 in absolute nominal terms. But because every dollar had less buying power over time, adjusting for inflation, operating revenue was 4% lower over time while expenses were basically inflation adjusted back to their 2019 level. This is the real change. Uh, for the average organization, it was back to where it started. Uh, here I've taken basically the exact same chart as in the, the previous slide and lowered it down so I could show you visually uh, 
what does it look like with the inflation adjustment? It gives a visual sense of how far a dollar went for organizations each year relative to 2019. And you can see in that coral colored line that the bottom lines were boosted in 21 and 2022 uh, as doors were closed and the federal relief funding was flowing in. That 4% deficit in 2023, it may be an anomaly, or it could be a sign that the duration of substantial relief funds hasn't matched the slower rebuild and return experienced by most organizations, particularly theaters, as regular operations resume. You know, so thinking about that double whammy of expense resumption as organizations are reopening, beginning to realize that audiences aren't coming back at the same levels initially, coupled with the fact that each dollar spent wasn't going as far as it did previously. Let's look at how this affects working capital. So what is working capital? Um, before jumping into that, you know, th this is, it's such a sexy topic. I know everyone can't wait to talk about working capital. Um, if you would use the chat uh, and just give your answer to the question, has your organization ever been cash strapped? And what did that feel like? You know, if, if you have ever been in charge of an organization that has been cash strapped, you know more than you may want to know about the importance of working capital. It's the kind of thing where few people wake up excited about it, uh, but it's the kind of thing that you lose sleep over if you don't have it. When we look at working capital, we define it as a measure of the organization's liquidity. It represents uh, unrestricted resources available to meet day-to-day -day obligations, basically ready access to available cash to pay your bills. And we calculate it as unrestricted current assets minus current liabilities. There are other ways to calculate it. This is the most simple and straightforward and we talk about a metric called months of working capital. It's just a useful metric that shows how long an organization could survive at its current expense size in the absence of revenue. So months of liquidity, it declines, of course, when an organization runs a deficit um, or because they encountered an unanticipated revenue loss. So why does it matter? I love this quote. Again, this was from a Ford grantee who shared that liquidity like cash flow sounds simplistic, but it lets you dream big and really think ahead about strategic growth, which you can't do if you can't turn the lights on. It relieves the not sleeping at night issue and lets you get beyond basic needs. It's where resiliency begins. So let's look at what it was. This is back in 2019. In that year, most organizations had less than six months of working capital heading into the pandemic. So here we're seeing the average or the arithmetic mean, which was 10.7 months. Um, this is actually skewed a bit high. It's a bit misleading because there are some organizations uh, that have particularly high levels of working capital concentrated among a small number of organizations. And so we're gonna look here at the median, uh, which is the midpoint in the range, the experience of at least half of the organization. This was the case back in 2019 during a Goldilocks economy. With government relief pouring in and doors closed, unrestricted current assets grew and current liabilities shrank, which caused a rise in working capital. During 2019, to think back, organizations tended to end their fiscal years near the break-even point, so they had nothing to squirrel away. Then doors closed, so expenses pivoted, and relief funding was awarded. It was a huge boost to working capital, as with the, the McKenzie Scott funding and the Ford funding, the ACT funding for BIPOC organizations. Now recall that the operating surpluses for the norm from 2020 to 2022, we're seeing that store of funds reflected here, but not 2023. So the, the value of current assets was, adjust, was just over twice what it was pre-pandemic, even after adjusting for inflation over time. And current liabilities were 14% lower uh, than they were in 2019, although they shot up nearly 40% just from the, the last year alone, 2022 to 2023. So, you know, again, we asked the question, is this new level of liquidity realistically sustainable? Uh, or we're going to see uh, in 2024 a big erosion of working capital as savings are used to plug holes in revenue projections that don't materialize. So how are organizations contending with this right now as they're thinking about the future. I want to just leave with some recommendations, both for funders as well as for organizations. So recommendations for the stabilizing and restoring health, particularly related to working capital and to funding. Um, support plans 
that can adapt to shifting dynamics to support flexibility, reimagining, rebuilding. We encourage funders to support strategic um, initiatives for new business models and adaptation that organizations self-define. You know, encourage organizations to create that plan B that doesn't count on a once in a lifetime level of government support. Invest in capacity that addresses human capital gaps. Fund multi-year operating support before encouraging programmatic growth. Let people pay their people, let them grow their staffs without having to add more programmatic activity on the backs of the same individuals. Small organizations in particular, they stay small, not because they necessarily want to, but because they lack dedicated staff expertise in generating earned and contributed revenue. And they've historically faced barriers to access their higher levels of funding. Reinforce new business models. As organizations enter 2024 with demand for in-person programming still down, uh, continued into 2024, they need a mix of flexible support. So signaling trust by making unrestricted gifts offered for longer periods of time and contribute to working capital and savings, help prevent history from repeating itself. You know, the pandemic presented donors with an opportunity to support cash reserves in addition to funding strong programs. Uh, you know, thinking about how to make sure that organizations are put in the kind of position where they can weather a future downturn. And for organizations, uh, know your financial risks. Can you afford a deficit this year? You know, if one materializes, how are you going to eliminate it moving forward? Assess and project cash levels and flows. Explore a few alternative pathways, develop scenarios for surplus. Come up with at least two plans as scenarios for surplus. Plan to redo your plans. Uh, you know, uncertainty is a given. Monitor results regularly. Create a plan B that doesn't count on exceptional government support and be ready to implement it. And keep reforecasting as soon as you know that you need to. And lastly, you know, start setting savings goals. Be realistic and be patient. Uh, you know, get your board together to talk about these issues. You know, if for example, you had a goal of saying our goal three years from now is to have three months of working capital and on a consistent level, then budget for a surplus equal to one month's expenses in each of the coming three years. Uh, these are recommendations that we put together in uh, partnership with Rebecca Thomas uh, from Rebecca Thomas and Associates. Uh, you know, looking at how to have a, a stable capital structure in the midst of so much environmental uncertainty is, is really, uh, you know, sometimes really difficult as you're weathering the, the storm, but also it's the thing that can help to provide the ballast uh, in the event, in the very likely event that there will be some other crisis at some point in time that we want to be able to be prepared for and responsive to. And with that, Monica, let's hear from folks about uh, whether these findings align with their experiences. Oh, absolutely, Zani. Um, we're going to do this chat about it again. So if you would like to share your experience with the staffing data and the working capital data, um, you are welcome to use the chat. Or if you would like to raise your hand, we can uh, share um, uh, permissions to allow you to share your comments directly with Zani. But Zani, I will also share that uh, our questions and comments section has been a buzz as you were sharing some of these findings. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to share one of the questions that has already come in as folks are typing in their responses. Sure. Um, and it's about uh, part-time employees, just thinking about uh, mm -hmm. staffing really briefly. As you highlighted in your, in your slides, um, both impact organizations as art workers. So they're part-time employees, impact organizations and art workers, um, particularly those operating within unstable gig uh, economies. Mm -hmm. Considering the potential benefits for the organization, does this shift raise questions uh, about the impact on the livelihood of folks who are working part-time in, in these art and cultural organizations? Absolutely. Uh, I showed what, what were the trends? So it was good news in that the full-time employees, permanent employees kind of stayed stable, that we didn't see that shift away from full-time and towards part-time. The growth is happening in the part-time. What I didn't show is what are all the trends with respect to seasonal employees and to independent contractors. We saw during the pandemic that those two categories were all but decimated during the pandemic. You know, the first thing to cut are those to whom you don't have the, the longer term commitment. 
And that does leave our industry kind of with a big question mark about, you know, ethically, how are we responsible, not just to those who are currently working within our organization, but to arts employees writ large. And when we think about who those employees are, you know, what kinds of salaries are they being paid? When we're seeing increases in compensation, um, is there a certain class of arts worker that's benefiting uh, more so than others? So, you know, it's a great question and there's a lot more uh, that can be explored within that hiring. When we do the data update in July, I'm really interested to see with the influx of more data, uh, data from more organizations through 2023, what's the extent to which the experience of these 233 organizations is reinforced versus what kinds of shifts what we, might we be seeing uh, in other categories? I'm, I'm curious, would there be interest in us providing more detail in trends about also the independent contractors and seasonal workers? Oh, that's a really good question, Zania. I'll let to, I'll wait to see if folks respond to that one. Okay. Um, I do want to share a comment that came from James Lynch, um, and they shared that uh, that this data, the staffing data, is really hitting home for them, mm -hmm. as we're asking folks to do more with programming and and growth on the back of an already overdone workforce. Yeah, yeah. You know, for organizations that kind of follow our work regularly or have a CDP, uh, you know, complete the CDP, we look at, we have something called a key intangible performance indicator dashboard or the KIPI dashboard. And within that dashboard, organizations get to see how they're doing relative to other organizations like theirs and with similar uh, community characteristics. And a measure we followed over time has been a visitor to staff ratio. And it's basically saying, you know, it's a great thing to see engagement and attendance increasing but staffing levels have to increase as well. Like you can't keep putting the burden on serve more people, serve more people on a very limited staff. Uh, you know, so what are the investments that are made in putting together the two different, you know, oftentimes disparate notions of saying, we need to have more programming versus what are we doing to take care of the people who are providing that programming? in terms of compensation levels and in terms of number of people, what is our organizational capacity? And is it a stable balance to the, the programming levels that we're expected to deliver? I feel like this is really speaking to those who are in the trenches doing the work. Um, mm -hmm. Zani, I, I did get a response about breaking out that data and uh, there are some thumbs up. They like cool. to be able to see that. Um, just taking us in a bit of a different direction, we got a couple mm -hmm. of questions um, about uh, businesses and consumerism. So um, do you have a sense of the trends in consumer spending and pricing? And that's including for-profit theaters and sports um, and comparing that to this consumer spending on nonprofit and arts and cultural organizations, just to kind of get that comparison information. Uh, what a great suggestion for a follow-up study. No, I don't have the, the data analyzed in looking at that particular question. Uh, but thank you for the suggestion. It's certainly something that we can look at and report out on. Zani, I think we've asked and answered all of the questions. I still want to give space okay. for folks. If there's anyone who wanted to chat about it, about some of those findings and maybe come off mute and share directly with Zani, if you could raise your hand, we'd be happy to give you that in our last few minutes, like last two minutes that we have for Q&A. And as we wait on folks to maybe engage us that way, I do see we have one more question, Zani, and this is from uh, Sandra Stevens Albright. Um, are there small business programs that support working capital? And I'm gonna open this up to the veterans in, this, in the room as well, who could also help us answer this question. Are there small business programs that support working capital that we in the arts can learn from? Um, I would love to go to a bank sponsor and ask for that type of support. Not that I'm aware of. If someone else here is aware of it, um, you know, please do report out to the, to the group. Um, you know, I can say that I remember at the start of the pandemic, there were so many BIPOC organizations that were not able to take advantage of the PPP program because those were being done through banks. And in, there's been so much systemic bias in banking 
and communities of color, that that was a barrier to being able to access funding. I, I think that it's a question of what's the extent to which there's a level of trust built up in acknowledgement. You know, we've done studies in buffering uncertainty as a a study that we did with Rebecca Thomas, looking at uh, the the health in working capital for BIPOC organizations, who actually tend to have higher levels of working capital than non-BIPOC organizations, mainly because they have no choice but to be self-sufficient, to run surpluses, to continue their working capital because they don't necessarily have the same opportunities for accessing um, external loans and external access to capital. Uh, so it, it, it would be wonderful if there were funders who were considering how can we help organizations not just generate new programs, which are exciting, but also establish cash reserves so that they are more readily prepared to be able to face another, another crisis at some point, whether it's a huge environmental crisis, a local crisis, or just an organizational crisis. Awesome. Thank you so much, Zani. And I just wanted to bring in Meredith's question. Mm -hmm. um, and Meredith asked about uh, the 233 organizations um, as a part of a study. And I just wanted to clarify really quickly, these are our cultural data profile organizations. And uh, Zani, I wanted to give space to say thank you to those CDP users. Yes. Thank you again to all of the those who submit data through a CDP. And we have data on more organizations, but we wanted to only follow the same set of organizations over time. So these organizations have provided information in each of the past five uh, fiscal years. As I said, they're from 14 states, 11,000 budget up to 15.8 million. It's, it's a variety of arts and cultural disciplines. Um, and the number of organizations will only become more robust as we continue to receive data from more organizations about 2023. So at the start of a calendar year, there's not a whole lot of organizations that already have uh, you know, completed an audit or finalized financial statements for the most recent year that builds as our calendar year goes on. Um, and, you know, I, I want to say that the, the story for 2024, it remains unwritten. You know, time is going to tell whether the resiliency resi exhibited by organizations in the wake of previous crises uh, is going to prevail, whether this proves like it was a crisis like no other and really necessitates radical change. Uh, but survival long term, it hinges on organizations embracing and adapting to new models, uh, bolstering, bolstering building relationships, rethinking how they understand and meet the needs of those whom they seek to serve. Um, and I hope you will follow up with us. We're always curious to hear whether there are findings that really resonated with you um, as they relate to what you know of the landscape or whether there are some findings that I reported on today that you find completely counterintuitive to your experience? Um, you know, are there ways in which your organization is uh, reflecting these larger trends or really bucking them? Zani, I think that's a really great place to, to end our conversation today. I just want to point out that our chat space has been really moving with folks sharing different advice and perspectives and different comments. Um, so I want to say to each of you who joined us today, thank you for sharing with us and engaging with us and sharing your successes and questions with us. Um, it's been very valuable to this work. Um, as we shared, our a lot of this data is coming from the cultural data profile. And for those who are new to that, we wanted to to share some resources about the CDP. There are different support systems within our online platform. But I just also want to share ways to stay connected with us. We can go to that next slide. If you have any questions or if you would like to know about our next wave of research, um, there's so many ways to stay connected with us. You can uh, attend our webinar programs. You can read our articles and blogs. You can also stay connected to our research. Um, and our team is going to share a link to our latest research so that you can read through all of the data that's coming from SMU Data Arts. Uh, I'll also ask my team to share our national trends uh, research, our report that we've been talking through today one more time, because in there, there is a space where you're welcome to share more of your perspectives. Um, so if you would like to give us more feedback to accompany our next release of uh, trends as they come forward throughout the summer, we would love to be able to connect with you and continue engaging with you and sharing the stories this way. 
I think that is everything that I had to to say and share. Um, I want to say thank you to each of you for joining us. Zani, did you want to share any last thank yous? Just to please keep in touch. Uh, you know, for the organizations whose data is it reflected today, this is your story. We want to hear the story of what's going on in the field. Um, thank you for allowing us to learn with you. Yes, awesome. We will share a follow-up email that'll have access to the recording and our slides that we use today. And uh, if there are any questions that you have, we uh, will share our contact information in that as well. Thank you for joining us today. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.